Well, we're excited. We're back. We had a fun time. We did find out that our little granddaughters uh, uh, did not like the windy, curvy road, and her tummy came out of her mouth. She would say, my tummy hurts. Blech. You ever cleaned up a car seat? It ain't fun. So anyways, we had a great time. We're excited we're back. Um, I'm excited. We're, we're at a place in these covenant teachings. Today is a very monumental passage because we're getting into the Passover. Okay, and, and the Passover of the old covenant was monumental to the new covenant. And, and so, of course, we're in the teaching God of the covenants. God is a covenant-making God and a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah. And so if we kind of back up a little bit and we look at it, so we're in the land of Goshen, uh, which is in northern Egypt, and Abraham's descendants have been living there for about 400 years, which he told Abraham was going to happen. This wasn't anything surprising. He made Abraham aware that, that his descendants would be uh, taken slaves. Um, think about it. When they first went into Egypt, when, when um, they went in, there was 70 of them that went in. And now, 400 years later, there's millions of Hebrews in the land. And what happened was, well, and, and this is a fulfillment of what God told Abraham, that your descendants would be like the stars of the, si the sky and the sands of the sea. And so they went from 70 to millions. And God was bringing about his promise to Abraham to build a nation. The only problem is this nation now is in captivity and in slavery because as the kings of Pharaohs changed, the favor that Joseph got in the beginning are, is no longer given to them. They've now, because of the numbers, have been made to be slaves in the land. And as they went along, you know, the pharaohs got crueler and crueler, and now they're treating the people almost inhumanely. And generally, Scripture tells us that they're, they're making bricks because, of course, then they would take the bricks and build Ephesus for themselves, to live in, palaces and fortresses and things and so on, out of these bricks. And the pharaohs working them. And, of course, Scripture tells us that in their misery, they cried out to God to deliver them. And, of course, we know we talked about how Moses put in the basket, taken by the pharaoh's daughter, raised in Egypt, uh, came down, saw his fellow uh, Hebrews, and killed one of the taskmasters, and in such, he ran to Midian, was there for 40 years as a shepherd. God called him out at the burning bush and tells him that he wants to let them, or use him to go let, set the people free. So we knew that God was hearing their groanings, and I love it in Exodus 2, 23 and 24, it says, God remembered his covenant with Abraham. That's a huge thing to recall because God is a God of covenants and God is a covenant-making God and God is a covenant-keeping God. And so when you and I approach God, we need to do it through our covenants because that's what he's bound to. God is bound to the covenant that he's made and, and Jesus has allowed us to be a part of the new covenant. And so God remembered the covenant he made with Abraham. And so realistically, God must deliver them from the bondage and bring them into the land that he promised Abraham. God promised Abraham this, and because God is a God that cannot lie, he had to get the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt. Okay? Generally, where it goes sideways for us is how is he going to do it? You know how you and I, we get to places in our lives and we need God to show up for us. And, you know, usually we pick door three and he comes out of door one. Just to remind us that he is just God and he'll do things the way he wants to do things. But we know in our hearts that whatever he does, it's going to be good for us. No matter what path he takes, what avenue he uses, it's going to be good for us. And generally, I have found it's even better than I wanted it to be. 
The outcome is better than I was imagining. And that's why when we'll just allow him to do what he does on our behalf and have faith that he's for us and not against us and whatever he does is for our good and allow him to work in our lives. So now um, we see that God chose Moses as his instrument to lead his people out of bondage. And so basically a few weeks ago when I ended, that's right where we ended, Moses and Aaron were before the Pharaoh. And in, in um, Exodus 5.1, they approached Pharaoh and said, Thus saith the Lord of God of Israel, let my people go. And of course, as we all know, Pharaoh said, Hey, cool, go ahead and get out of here. See you later. No. Pharaoh says, Hey, in verse 2, he says, Who is this the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let them go. And the amazing part is that's what God told Moses that the Pharaoh was going to do. He told Moses that, listen, you're going to go talk to the Hebrews and they'll get on board with you as far as leading them out. But when you go to Pharaoh, he's going to reject what you're asking to do. So there shouldn't have been any surprise to Moses and the sad reality is, for the Hebrews, uh, the story uh, gets worse before it gets better. I don't know if you've ever been in that place in life, but I know for me it seems like I was at the bottom and a little bit more bottom showed up before I started going up. But I've learned, like I said, to trust God in these things in our lives, to allow him to do what he needs to do, because sometimes what happens is you and I need to adjust the way we see things. And sometimes that adjustment comes when things get a little worse. Do we want that to happen? No. Is it fun to happen? No. But does it need to happen? Sometimes. Sometimes I need to have something jolt me enough to get me out of the mindset that I'm in and change my mindset and actually realize that God is bigger than even what I thought he was. And God was able to work in a greater way than I even thought he was able to. And like I said, in the end, it always works out for our glory. God is a good God. And, and so now what happens is the taskmasters, because Pharaoh is mad now at Moses, saying, hey, you're trying to take away my slaves, and so what he did is he talked to the taskmaster and said, all right, make it harder on them. So the Egyptians used to provide the straw for the Hebrews to make the bricks. But now Pharaoh says, make them go get their own straw. But they still had to produce the same amount of bricks in the same amount of time and made it harder on them. So now what we find out is that the people are mad at Moses because they're working harder, and now Moses is upset with God. Because this ain't going the way he thought it should be going. And so God's like, why, why are you making, why is this happening to the people? You're making it harder on them. And so God tells Moses to trust him. His plan will work. You know, I made in my notes, ever been there? where God just says to you and I, will you just trust me? Will you allow me to do what I do so well? Will you step aside, put your preconceived ideas aside of how this needs to be done, and let me do what I'm going to do? Because I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, and I know what is the best course for your situation. And that's where sometimes it becomes hard because we're waiting on God. It seems like God isn't moving on our behalf. Like, God, what's taking so long? And we sometimes do the same thing. We get frustrated like Moses did. Like, God, what's going on? But if we'll just trust him. You know, that's one of the things through all of the years, going through all of life, in the last 33 years of being a believer, of course, life happens to all of us. Sometimes the trauma is created by me. Sometimes the tr 
tra the trauma is created by the world system, and sometimes the trauma is created by the devil. But I have realized it doesn't matter how the trauma came. I know that God is the answer and the source and the redeemer of the situation. The question is, will I trust him enough to fix and redeem that which is broken? And will I give him the time to do it? See, that's an area a lot of times us as believers struggle with is the time thing. Because we're going to look here in a minute that God sends Moses to set the captives free. So he's already went to Pharaoh once, and Pharaoh said, No, I don't know this God, and I don't know who he is, and no, you can't go. Moses didn't say, All right, that's it. We're done here. God, Pharaoh said, No. Pack your stuff. Aaron and I are leaving. You Hebrews have a nice day. We're gone. Moses, think of what he went through. All the ten times that he went to Pharaoh, and nine of the ten times, Pharaoh shut him down. Nine out of the ten times. Who here wants to sign up for that job? Right? But in the end, did the results happen that God wanted to happen? Absolutely. Did the people get set free? Absolutely. Did they get set free with silver and gold and wealth? Absolutely. I can assure you, when they were standing at the starting line of being set free, they never imagined leaving with all the Egyptian wealth in their hands. So, plan A, just leave. Plan B, leave wealthy. I'm plan B. But remember, and this is life again, they had to go from plan A through all that needed to happen to get to plan B. They had to be there and being slaves and working hard while Moses and Aaron are up talking to the Pharaoh. They're not taking a break. They're still making bricks. They're still producing. The whole time all these plagues are taking place, they're still working. And so we realize that. So, uh, you know, there's sometimes in Scripture I just, I love the, the picture or the scene that the Scripture creates. I loved it when, when God said, hey, Moses, what's that in your hand? He's like, it's a staff. Throw it on the ground. All right. Oh, it's a snake, and Moses fled. I love that picture. That's too cool. Right? So right now, pick it up. And then Moses like, yeah. Picks it up, becomes a staff again. Sticks his hand in his coat, pulls it out. It's all leprous, white. You know that had to be like, uh oh, this ain't good. Put it back in, comes out fresh like baby skin. Those are cool scenes to me. I mean, that's just God showing that he's God. And so this next passage of scripture in um, um Exodus 7, I'm going to read 7 through 13. Um, and Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. I'm sure that didn't surprise him. It already happened once, okay? So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same with their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. You're like, all right, now, looks like they've got something on us here. Because there's only one serpent of Aaron's staff, but all of these sorcerers and magicians all cast theirs down, so there's multiple snakes on their side. So it's, you know, four to one, five to one, however many it was. Um, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Right? The one defeated the many. That's our God. That's our God. It doesn't matter what's set before us. Our God is greater. 
than whatever the enemy wants to try and bring at us. Whatever the world system tries to bring at us, our God is greater. We just have to set our hearts to that truth that whatever it is, God is bigger than our circumstances. doesn't matter. Amen? And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know, I find it interesting because sometimes in our lives, you know, the Holy Spirit unctions us to go share with somebody, go be a part of something, and we go, and it doesn't turn out the way we hoped it would. Maybe even get rejected. And so the situation comes to a close. A day, two days later, a week later, God says, hey, I want you to go back and approach those people or approach that situation again. It's like, you didn't see what happened last time, Lord? Were you on the, in the restroom or snoozing? or It didn't work out well last time. And, and you know, God is doing a work in them because when, when you and I speak the word of God to somebody, when we share the good news or the testimony of the goodness of God, now the Holy Spirit has this word that's alive and active, and he's working in their lives so that when you go back the next time, you're received differently. God has caused them to look at their situation or look at the truth that you're sharing with them in a different light. The question is, will we trust God and go back again? Because this is now the second time that the Pharaoh said, no, I'm not letting the people go. Even after watching the Aaron snake swallow the magician's snake, Pharaoh still said, no, I'm not believing this. I'm not going to adhere to it. And, and so we see that times in our lives, we just have to trust that when God sends us back, um, that he, it's going to bear fruit that it's going to work out, that we're going to trust God. Because I can assure you, probably in our lives, we had multiple people show up to us at different times trying to love us into the kingdom or love us into a truth that we thought was a lie. And, and as we know as believers, God never said it was going to be easy. He just promised that it would bear fruit. The question is, will we trust him? And it really comes down to that. Will we trust God, not only with our lives, but with the lives of the people around us? You know, because I've shared the gospel with many people at work to no avail from what it looks like. From what I see on the outside. But you know what? My job isn't to bring the harvest. Your job isn't to bring the harvest. Your job is to sow the seed and water the seed and leave the harvest to the Lord. It sure is a much more peaceful place to know when you walk away that you've sown a seed, or maybe watered a seed, and it may be two years or 20 years later that God brings a harvest in that person's life, but part of that process was because you were faithful to sow the seed and water the seed. That's all we're called to do. Sow the seed, water the seed. And you know what? There are times in our lives when we get the fortunate opportunity to actually watch the harvest take place. It's a wonderful thing because you know that the angels of heaven are rejoicing, that the kingdom of darkness has lost and the kingdom of light has won. But the victory is ours and the battle is the Lord's. We need to be able to rest in that fact. And so now what happens is, for the sake of time, we're just going to graze over the ten plagues. So now begins the ten terrible plagues, and each plague is designed to show God is greater than the gods of Egypt. Each one of these plagues may look like on the surface they were just kind of a random thing that God chose to do, but actually what God was doing was showing the Pharaoh that he was greater and more powerful than any of the gods that the Pharaoh believed in or that the Egyptians believed in. And so there was a purpose and a plan for each plague, even though they looked fairly random. Uh, I'm going to read off what the plagues were. The first plague was the water turning to blood. And, of course, I know that was in the, in the Nile River, and the Nile River was one of their gods. 
that they worship the Nile. Okay. Uh, the second one was frogs. Now, who wants the plague of frogs? Frogs are kind of cute one at a time, maybe two, but thousands or millions? No. The third one was gnats. Uh, the fourth one was flies. None of that sounds good, I'm just telling you. Uh, and then the Egyptian livestock die. That's number five. Number six are boils. Number seven is hail. Number eight, locusts. And number nine, darkness. Now you have to remember that in, in the aspect of all of these plagues, the land of Goshen was not hindered by the plagues. God had protected his people from the plagues. Just the Egyptians dealt with the plagues. And so we find out at the end of nine plagues that God had given Pharaoh every chance to let the Hebrew people go, but the Pharaoh still would not yield. And so the tenth plague is the plague we're going to focus on because it has a huge um, aspect of the types and shadows of Christ. And if you think about, as we have went through a lot of these covenants, God is always trying to remind his people that a Savior is on the way. This seed that he spoke to, uh, to um, Adam right after sin came, that there was a seed coming of a woman, and that the seed would crush his head, but the, the seed's heel would be bruised. And, of course, we know that is Christ. But remember that from the time of that prophecy to the cross, all of these covenants we've been covering take place in there, and God is trying to remind his people, I'm at work. I'm going to bring about what I promised. That seed is going to come. And so when Abraham was ready to slay his son and the ram came up the other side, a type of Christ, you know, you just see over and over and over again God showing Christ to the people. Reminding them, hey, it's on the way, be patient. I'm at work here. Trust me, I'm able to do this. Um, and so God declared the tenth plague. And in chapter 12, we're going to look at that and read what... And of course, chapter 12, it starts out, the, the title over it is the Passover. And there's so much in here, and I know Corey knows all about this because he's, he's looked at and, and um, understand this, but there's so much in this passage that for the sake of time, I can't pull it all out, but I encourage you to go read it and look at it. We'll read over at 12, um, 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh at night, roast it on a fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. 
I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when you see the blood, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So here we see God's coming with this 10th plague, and it's called the Passover. And, and we notice in this stator is what it's called, the order. God was very specific uh, in the way he set out this Passover. There were things that were to be done in certain order. And, and a lot of times, and, and the, it's called the stator, Passover stator, is, and the word just means order. And there was a very specific order that the Hebrews were supposed to do this. Um, and so we're, for the sake of time, we're going to look at the, we're going to focus on the lamb and its blood because this is the type and the shadow of Christ, our Passover lamb. So God says, hey, listen, what you need to do for the, for the destroyer or the death angel to pass over your home and no destruction to your home, you need to kill a lamb and take its blood and put it on the doorpost and the lentil of your home, okay? And so we see this sacrificial lamb as the, the product that causes God not to uh, or to pass over the home. And if you picture them taking the blood and they would be putting it on the lentils, or the, the, the doorpost and the lentils. Well, that is the sign of the cross. It's the upward. And what is the blood being applied to? It's being applied to the wood. So you have the blood and the wood typifying a cross that he would die on. And so because of the blood applied to the home, then that home was spared or saved, if you want to call it that. There was no destruction that comes to that home. And remember, it needed to be a spotless lamb without blemish. Without spot or blemish. And what was Jesus? The spotless lamb of God. Okay? Um, and so there are so many parts of this Passover um, proclamation that God gave them that were fulfilled and pointed to by Jesus. It's really amazing if you sat down and studied all that took place uh, in the Passover given to the Hebrews and what Jesus went through. And so God instructed the Israelites to observe the Passover feast as a lasting memorial every year when they came to Jerusalem to sacrifice, it was Passover. That's why they came. And the blood of the Lamb was applied for their sake, taken into the Holy of Holies, put on the mercy seat, and sin was covered for a year. But you have to remember that the blood um, is what showed them that their sins were just covered. See, remember, every year, year after year, they would go to the temple, bring their sacrifice, and their sins were covered for a year. So that temple and that sacrifice always reminded them they had a sin debt. It always made them aware that, that this isn't enough. It's what God has given us as a, as a temporary uh, covering for us. Just like when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with the fig leaf and God said that's not going to work. And I'm here to say, I bet the first animal that died to cover Adam and Eve was a lamb. It was a type and a shadow of what was to come. And there's nothing better to wear than nice fuzzy lamb loin. And so we see this now that God has made this a yearly memorial. And what I like is it says that, that it's to go throughout your generations a statue forever. 
This is not, it has still not ended today, and we're going to see how you and I keep that. You and I still do of nature a Passover to remind ourselves of God being the redeemer of his people. And then we fast forward around 1,500 years to John the Baptist, and here comes Jesus walking down the road, and what is it that John the Baptist declared? Behold the spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. See, now, taking away is much different than covering. You know, you can sweep the floor, lift up the corner of the rug, and put the dirt under the rug and say, ah, dirt's gone. Or you can put it in the dustpan, take it out, put it in the garbage can, and it, you've taken it away. There's a huge difference. And, and so we see that John recognized and knew that a day was coming when this lamb was going to show up. And it's interesting because scripture says he was the greatest prophet of them all. Because he was the one that was able to proclaim the actual fulfillment that all of the other prophets had spoken of. You know, you think of Isaiah 53 where it talked about Jesus and how he was going to die. You know, you think of Isaiah 9, 6, where it said a virgin will give birth. And I have a son, and his name, his name will be Emmanuel. And so now all of these covenants and all of these promises are now starting to the shadow. Let me put it this way. That which was casting the shadow is now starting to be revealed. This Christ that was born in the manger as prophesied, is now grown up, and he's now entered his ministry field, and, he, and that which he was sent for to do is getting ready to take place. And it's all the fulfillment of all of this that we just read on the Passover. Um, and so now, 1,500 years later, the Lamb of God shows up. 1,500 years later, the Lamb finally is in bodily form, as prophesied, and ready to enter his ministry. And so in his ministry, of course, we know that he was baptized, that the Spirit of, the, the Spirit of God came and descended on him. He went into the desert. He overcame the lies of the devil, which Adam and Eve fell for, and he was victorious to that. And he did all of that for us, for you and I. It wasn't for him. He was the spotless lamb of God. We were the ones, as the Hebrew, that were in bondage to sin. We were the ones held in sway of sin's dictatorship through the law. The law is what found us guilty of falling short of that which God required. But Jesus then came and became our sacrificial lamb. He was... So a lot of times I'm not sure we recognize when we get to that Easter weekend and we recognize that, you know, he went through all that he went through, was hung on the cross, died, buried, and resurrected. And those are all very essential parts of the scene. But if we back up and see Jesus with his disciples, they were doing the Passover. It was Passover. See, God planned out Christ on the cross on Passover weekend. So that the Passover lamb now showed up at Passover. And he died to take away sin and made all of this old covenant stuff obsolete for you and I. And it's amazing that, you know, Christ, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. You know, there's many places in Scripture where it talks about him being this fulfillment for you and I. And, and you have to realize that it wasn't just for the Hebrew people now said that Christ died once for all humanity. 
this other flock of sheep that Jesus spoke of now is coming into light, and that's the Gentiles. See, the, in, in the Old Covenant, the Gentiles never had Passover. They didn't have a sacrificial system. They were literally in the world without hope. They had no Savior. But in the goodness of God and the mercy of God, he knew that he was going to wrap all of it up because for God so loved the world, not the Hebrew people, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'm thankful because I'm a Gentile in the realm of God's chosen people, the Jews. Still God's chosen people, but thankfully in Christ we're grafted in. We're adopted into the family by faith. And, and so we see uh, in 1 Peter 1, um, 18 and 19, uh, I'm going to have Tim put that up on the screen. I put it in the Passion, and I've got it differently here. For you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life handed down from generation to generation. See, that's that generations of doing the Passover to cover sin. Now it's talking about how it was a futile way of life handed down from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold, which eventually perishes, but with the precious blood of Christ, who like a spotless, unblemished lamb, was sacrificed for us. He was sacrificed for you and I. And then Hebrews um, 9.12 in the passion and he has entered once and forever into the holiest sanctuary of all not with the blood of animal sacrifices but with the sacred blood of his own sacrifice and he alone has made our salvation secure forever he has made our salvation secure forever And so the reason that I wanted to do communion at the end was when you and I participate in communion, okay, what did Jesus say at the Last Supper? This is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. So when you and I take communion, it's a form of us taking the Passover remembrance. When you and I take the, bo- take the cracker and take the elements and the, and the juice, it's us declaring that our Passover lamb has been slain and that you and I now have been set free from the bondage that sin held us in, that you and I have been redeemed from all that sin did by the blood of Christ. And, and I really want us to get a hold of that fact that it's the sacrifice of the spotless lamb that set you and I free. It wasn't your works. It wasn't any of your talents, your abilities. Those are all great things to be used for the kingdom. But what set you and I free was the spotless lamb of God that was slain for us. And here's the way I picture it. So when you and I become believers, Scripture tells us that we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light of his Son. That the stained robe of sin, that scarlet robe has been removed, and that a white righteous robe has been put on us. Okay? And when God looks down, and sees you and I, he sees us through the Passover. He knows that we have been redeemed by the blood. In essence, we could say we have applied the blood to our doorpost of our lives. And that's why the world needs to understand that there's a day coming when God is going to come and judge humanity. And those that have applied the blood to their lives have already been judged. They've been judged righteous. And and the righteous judge passes by those innocent people 
because you and I have been declared innocent because of the blood, because of the application of blood. And that he will pass over us. Okay? And, and personally, because of the Passover picture in Scripture, I believe that whatever happens here on earth, pre-trib, mid-trib, pro-trib, God covers us from the plagues. That you and I are safe in whatever God does. And that's why I love to talk about the Scripture. And I really think in Scripture you can almost find a basis for every one of the tribulations. But if you look at back at how God has dealt with his people, God has always protected his people from tribulation. Scripture says we're not appointed unto a day of wrath. Okay? And, and so what happens is if you're in this place today and you've made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, if you've applied the blood of the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God to your life, you are in the camp of the Passover. And you ought to rejoice in that fact because if you notice, God didn't say if you put the blood on the lentils and the doorposts and you're clean and sober or uh, you're acting right every day. Uh, there's no sin in your life. There were no stipulations to the people in the house. They just had to be in the house. Okay? And you as well as I know that there were some stinkers in the houses. Right? It's just humanity. Okay? There might have been a husband and a wife fighting in the house as the death angel went over, but because the blood was on the doorposts and the lentils, it passed over. He didn't back up and go, wait a minute, are those two fighting? And I say that because too often we fall for the lie that we have to have the blood and something else. And I've always called that the grace plus message. You and I need to know that we're secure in Christ. Amen? We're secure in Christ. Should we do right? Absolutely. It benefits us to do right things. Sin is stupid. Sin will kill you. Sin will cause problems in your life. But it won't take away the fact that you're in Christ. Amen? And realistically, I have found that when I've settled down in, in the understanding of God's grace, it's actually caused me to desire not to do the dumb stuff more than the law ever did. In fact, Scripture tells us that the law is the strength of sin. When you put the law on somebody, it's the strength of sin. I'm telling you, watch little kids. If you tell them, do not go near that gate, they weren't even thinking about the gate until you mentioned the gate. It's just human nature, and God knows that, and that's why he deals with us through grace. Grace that saved you is the same grace that will sustain you. The law wasn't. The law is what shows you you're guilty. The law is what makes you feel guilty and condemnation and shame. God doesn't want us there. Romans 8.1, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so what I want to do is have communion. This is why I wanted to have communion at the end. Because I want you and I to see ourselves enjoying and understanding this Passover meal of nature. Is it the actual Passover meal? No. But I think it's a reminder for us that it's by the broken body and by the blood of Jesus Christ that we're redeemed. It reminds us what God instituted back in the land of Goshen as a plague to let his people go that we can remember that we're free because of this sacrifice. That's what communion should do for us every Sunday is remind us we have been set free by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. So whoever's going to do communion, if you'll come up and get the elements, I know Tim's going to come up, and um,
hey, I'm, I'm the one that set the whole thing out of whack, so it's my fault. Hmm? I didn't hear you. taken our sins away from us as far as the east is from the west. You and I have been so forgiven. And it's hard sometimes to talk to a gentleman this morning that just cannot wrap his head around the fact that when he sins, when he misses the mark, when he screws up, that he doesn't have to pay for that. He's born again, he knows the Lord, but he just, there's something in him right now that just can't comprehend that. And you know what? Sometimes I understand it because it's, it's almost too good to be true that everything, every sin, every past, every present, and every future has been paid for. It, it's complete. 
forgiveness is complete. And I've always said, I think one of the things that we need to understand is that it said that the spotless Lamb of God died for the sin of the world. And, and if you picture mankind was in a condition created by Adam and Eve called sin, and all of humanity was under this condition. And when Christ died, he died for that condition. He took away the sin of the world, the condition that we were in. And that's why you and I can go up to somebody and say, listen, your sins have been forgiven. You need to receive it. God is not holding man's sins against him, Scripture says. And why is that? Because the spotless lamb had been slain. The Passover lamb had been slain. The question for you and I in the end is, is the blood on your doorpost is really what it comes down to. I'm thankful that 33 years ago in a federal prison bunk, I applied the blood to my doorpost. And I'm also thankful that I didn't have to be perfect inside the house for him to pass over. Amen? And so when we take this communion today, let's picture ourselves in Christ. You and I are in Christ. He's in us. That's how God sees you and I, in the blood of the Lamb. And that's how he deals with you and I. And, and his body, he said, my body broken for you. By his stripes you were healed. It's a finished transaction. The question is, will you believe it? If I told you that, hey, I went to your bank last week and put a million dollars in your account, you have two choices. Believe it and receive it, or reject it as just something that I made up and that it's not there, right? Those are the two choices you have. And it, when, when Christ said that my body was broken for you, we have two choices. Believe it and receive it and apply it to our lives, or say, well, once I get my act together, or once I stop doing this, or once I start doing that, then... It's accessible to me. See, that's a lie. It's accessible to you, for you to, and I today because he said it was. He made it available. So let's receive it from him today. And then the, the cup of the new covenant in his blood. And aren't we thankful that this blood doesn't cover sins for a year, but this blood removed sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. We can rejoice in that fact. It's a truth. When the devil comes along and tries to get you to believe that you owe for your sins, you need to be able to stand up and say, no, I have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And he's cleansed me perfectly. And now I am complete in Christ, and that is a lie. Did I sin? Yes. Do I owe the penalty of it? No. Christ paid it on my behalf. Amen. Amen. If he was to charge you with the same sin he charged Jesus, that's double jeopardy. He cannot do that. But if we don't understand that and know that, we'll receive the lie and think that we owe, and then we go into all kinds of gyrations of trying to figure out how to pay for our sin. You know, is it more money in the offering? Is it reading the Bible? Is it praying? Is it building an orphanage? Is it sackcloth and ashes? You know, because that's what happens to us. We go through all of these things trying to figure out how to pay for our sin when we realize and come to the understanding that Christ paid for it for us. So let's receive it today, this spotless, blemish-free blood that was taken not into the earthly holy of holies, but this blood, as we read, in, in, was taken into the heavenly holy of holies, put on the mercy seat, and that which God required for forgiveness of sin was complete. It is finished.
Father, I thank you today as we close out this history lesson that we're learning of you and how you deal with mankind and you've given us a history to look back on. And I thank you that as we looked at the Passover plague today and then we went and looked at the spotless Lamb of God, your Son, our Savior, that gave himself for us so that we would be under the umbrella of your protection, that, that the Passover has taken place in our lives and that we now can rest in the finished work of our Savior and not in any of our doings and any of our beings, but we can just rest in the fact that Jesus said it is finished. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you as our teacher, would continue to reveal to us these truths so that we can get them in our hearts and settle down in, in the finished work of the cross. And so I give you praise and glory and honor today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, please... Wow. Please come up and let us pray for you. If you're here today and you have not received Christ, today's the day of salvation. Um, other than that, God bless you. I love you. You're the best God's got. Enjoy your afternoon. You got it? I think I read that one day. <laughs> See, and see, mom and dad are double blessed because it's...